for registration um, in the soccer dome. That's where you get your O2 SIM card from. Oh, okay. I don't think I've seen I that. I think okay. you've got some delegates that said something. Oh, so we find out if they're for this yeah. space and, and move them over. Oh, you don't have my number. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leonardo stage here at Campus Party. Um, first up on our agenda, we have Oscar Millet here from uh, Biogune, and he's going to be talking about the frequent cases of rare diseases. Later on in the day, we're going to have Bandy Mbubi from Fairtrade Mobile Phones, Leo Johnson at 2 o'clock. After that, Stuart Newstead talking about wireless cloud computing. After Stuart has concluded his speech, we'll have Vincent Lubier from Airbus talking about the interior of the new Airbus plane. 
And after Vincent, we're going to have Lawrence Kemble Cook, who actually uh, lighted the streets in the London Olympics on the pavement to save energy. And after dinner, we're going to have Adidas come in here to talk about their uh, technology in the clothes they wear. And then after Adidas, we're going to have Nick Hunt to conclude the day. But without further ado, I'd like to give you Oscar Millet. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm a scientist. I know that this is uh, a little bit uh, far away from the typical topics that, uh, that you would cover here in a, in a campus party. I'll try to, be, to give you an idea of uh, what we do. And the problem is that science is boring, you know? In order to be accurate, it has to be boring. So I'll try to do as, as flexible as I can. Let's start to say that we, we, can, we can say that life is metabolism. We can imagine life just simply as a bunch of reactions where there are certain enzymes that actually produce certain metabolites. And that's it. I mean, this is a just as good definition of life as any other. If we take it as our definition, we need those enzymes in order to create and maintain life. This slide here shows what is called the central dogma of biology. And this was actually discovered structurally, not so far away from here, with Watson and Crick discovering the double helix of DNA that I'm sure that all of you are aware about. Essentially, life is transmitted and maintained by DNA that encodes all the information necessary to really understand what we are. This information is transcribed and traduced into another molecule, which is called RNA, and then RNA goes to a protein. So we can always say that what we are is just a bunch of proteins. Each gene will encode for a different protein, and proteins actually have a certain function. This function could be either a structural function, but some of them are enzymes. And those enzymes are supposed, and they do, catabolize the reactions of the metabolism. Well, what happens when we have a problem in this enzyme, when the enzyme is not working properly? This enzyme is not working properly, it will produce unavoidably what is called a rare disease. We have about seven, 10,000 enzymes in our body that produce, uh, that regulate seven, 10,000 reactions in the body, or more even. If we have a problem in one of these enzymes, translated into the cell on the, on the, mo on the moment of conception, in the, in the gonads, then we're gonna inherit one of these rare diseases. And actually, 80% of all the rare diseases are caused by gene deficiency. What is a mutation? A mutation is no more, no less, than a change in the, in the code, in the genetic code, that transcribes for a different information. So if we change uh, one of these bases for another one, it's going to reduce to a different amino acid in the protein, and therefore it's going to produce uh, some change. Many people may think that mutations are actually wrong, they are a problem. Well, this is not always the case. I mean, mutations are the intrinsic base of evolution. It's the fact that makes that you are different than you, and both of you are different than me. It's the natural way of evolving as a species. It's also, it's also the same origin for cancer, for instance, which is the main source for cancer and many other diseases. But the mutations that produce cancer typically are produced in an adult body and in a certain part of it, and they are maintained and, and regenerated. Mutations that produce a rare disease are different. They are essentially going to be produced in the gametes, in the cells that are going to be uh, creating a new life. And that is a main problem, because if you have a mutation inherited, you will have the damn problem exactly in each and every one of your cells. And that is what makes it very, very drastic. So rare diseases are therefore diverse. They are very diverse. You you have many, many of them because you can target many, many different genes in there. Actually, it's supposed to be about 7,000 
of these different diseases. And for each of uh, and every one of these diseases, you can have different mutations in different amino acids. I'll explain you in a case study later on what happens, and that could create actually different degrees of the disease. But essentially, the most important thing is that there is a cause-effect relationship very clear that if you have a mutation in a certain gene, unavoidably, you will have a certain, uh, certain disease. That's why, typically, most of these diseases, you know, de novo, before you are going to have uh, some descendant, that you are prone to be uh, uh, passing through uh, this kind of disease. Hello? So, there is a problem with the uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> Don't send, uh, yeah. That was a mutation. Yeah, that's, I, I, I can just go. Thank you. Rare diseases are also abandoned. Why? Because there are many people who suffer them. Actually, it is suspected, uh, it has been estimated that about 30 million people are living with rare diseases. Probably m some of you know somebody who actually is experiencing one rare disease either uh, in your family or some friends of you. I, I'm quite sure that like, uh, you, can, uh, you can find easily somebody who is uh, undergoing this uh, suffering, this, this kind of uh, rare disease. And actually, 350 million people wor worldwide are supposed to, uh, to suffer them. Those statistics, I'm sure, are underestimated. Why? Because we only report cases that are severe enough in order to go to doctor. But we don't know what is the normal variability of the genome. Therefore, certain cases of mild effects could be considered as well rare diseases, even though they are not being properly diagnosed. They are abandoned, but they are rare as well. Why they are rare? Because for each a specific disease, it's very rare that you find somebody. I told you, I'm sure you know somebody who has a rare disease. But if I say, I don't know, a specific like uh, homocystinuria, the name of a rare disease, I'm also quite sure that you don't know anybody that has this rare disease. And that is exactly the problem of rare diseases, that the, there is a lot of people suffering it, but actually the definition of a rare disease is that that is affected by less than at least 50,000 people in the UK, 200,000 people in the United States, in the European Union, the consensus is around 100,000 people. And they are severe. That's exactly why I explained to you before, only the cases that are really, really bad go to the doctor. And therefore, those diseases are only diagnosed when they are severe. It's, it's just kind of a circular reference in itself. But the truth is that people who suffer that, essentially, uh, either they die very early, or they suffer that uh, forever. And they have very, very, very obvious effects. And uh, they have a shortened lifetime. So essentially, it's a corollary for that, is that rare diseases are actually a social problem because there is a lot of people who actually suffer them, but, but it is a very difficult problem to tackle because it's exactly the same problem to cure cancer than to cure each and every one of these uh, rare diseases as a, as a scientific problem. And therefore, people who suffer them, suffer them 100%, yet they, they, they don't have any, any insight from scientists or doctors in order to get cure for that. So then the question is that, if I were the CEO of a, of a pharmaceutical company, would I be interested in developing a drug that it's only going to cure 35 people in the whole Europe or 2,000 people in the whole Europe, for instance? Well, the straight answer would be no. But uh, actually, this is not completely true. There are certain differences that make that now 
rare diseases are actually good targets for uh, the pharmaceutical companies. Just uh, as a definition, suffice it to say that the, the kinds of drugs that are devoted to, uh, to rare diseases are called orphan drugs. What is essentially an orphan drug? Well, it's a pharmaceutical agent that it actually has been developed to treat one of these. It doesn't have to be a genetically inherited rare disease. It just has to be a disease that is, uh, uh, affects a few people. This is a very complicated graph, but essentially shows that there are two different interests in, in terms of a drug. There is the patient interest, and there is the pharmaceutical or the society industry. So essential medicines, the ones that actually tackle a headache or, or a cancer or whatever, would be here. They are both interesting from the drug point of view because the pharmaceutical company are going to sell a lot of these drugs and they are very important from the, from the patient-wise because there is a lot of people who are actually going to benefit. Orphan drugs would be exactly here. It's very hard, it's exactly the same price to develop a drug, yet, in principle, it affects only a few people. But there is a problem that the essential medicines actually are all done. I mean, it's not very easy to obtain a new drug for absolutely anything because the main targets are already covered. And it's very, very difficult for, uh, for a pharmaceutical company to obtain a new drug, for instance, for a kinase inhibitor that uh, it has a neurodepressor. Why? Because the, the drug agency requires that the new drug works better than the existing ones. Otherwise, they don't accept it. Whereas in the, in the orphan drug, everything is, is virginal. I mean, there is nothing down there. So that is one of the reasons why now pharmaceutical companies are moving into orphan drugs. So this is essentially a, a, a very brief uh, scheme of uh, how a drug is developed. You essentially work in drug discovery, so you, you have a lot of what is called chemical diversity. You, you look for a lot of compounds there that have to target specifically one of your enzymes. You, you have a proof of principle, what is called. You have an idea of, uh, I'll show you later in, in the case study, uh, our idea, how it works, and you will understand very easily. But you have to have an idea, and then you have to inhibit, typically, one molecule. And you have to try a lot of compounds. That is the drug discovery phase. Then you have to move to the, to the preclinical phase. It means that you work with animals, and there you have to reduce a lot the number of compounds that you want to you wanna work with. Then you work to clinical trials. Only You will only choose the candidates that are very promising, because this is very, very expensive. I'll show you in a minute. And if you're lucky enough and your company has enough money, at the end, you will get a drug into the market. So these phases actually work. Uh, they are expensive, progressively expensive, because they require a lot of people. A lot of people that actually need to take the drug. And the, 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 most, the most important ones are phase two, clinical phase two and three. That for those, you already have proven that the drug is good. But you have to prove that it's also safe. And this is the most important. In phase clinical three is essentially where most of the drugs really fail. Not because they are not good. I mean, they cure cancer. I mean, we have cured cancer several times in, in terms of a drug. But the problem is that they are not safe enough. It's just too bold, too coarse, the way that, uh, that uh, the drug does it. So why do I say that in this context? Well, because for orphan drugs, there are no patients. And therefore, you have to necessarily skip uh, those phases. And that actually makes uh, the process of drug development much, much cheaper. And this is the second reason why now uh, drug pharmas, uh, so pharmaceutical companies are going into, the, into this development. And the third one is that, because you don't have to forget that a pharmaceutical company is actually a stock market company. And the stock market is more psychology than other things. And to have in the pipeline a drug, even though it's not going to be a business, it is very, very good to have in the portfolio. So it's good for this, uh, for them when you have the, like in the, in the press and everything, that creates uh, 
an idea of uh, professionality and, and, uh, and uh, good uh, use of the company. And the reality is that those are just simply some uh, of the revenues of the of different uh, of different uh, drugs that are for rare diseases. So it could be a good uh, a good business, and those are the, the best ones. And there are even companies like Alexian Pharmaceuticals that are exclusively uh, exclusively working on ultra rare diseases, which means that the market is very low. The thing is that when you get the drug, the, the FDA and the European uh, Drug uh, Organization allows you to get a very, very high price for the drugs. Well, so, so this was the, the introduction, but I'm a scientist. I mean, we are, we are trying to, to, to work with, uh, with uh, some drug development. That's why I did this, this introduction in Northern Drugs. But essentially, what I'm going to discuss in this uh, second part of the, of the, of the talk is about one of these rare diseases. So let's, let's apply all these concepts to uh, what, uh, one of the rare diseases. In particular, is the congenital erythropoietic porphyria, which is the one that, that I'm, I'm working with uh, for the last seven years. I told you we are metabolism. In particular, for this rare disease, we are interested in the heme group biosynthesis metabolism. Essentially, the heme group, which is this guy here, I mean, sorry for the, for the molecules, I mean, it's almost impossible to avoid that, but just simply, if you are not chemist, just have a look at cartoons. This is the molecule that contains the heme group. The heme group is the red color of blood. It's also the vitamin that, uh, that avoids you to, to be burned in, uh, in the skin. And it's also part of a vita of vitamin that uh, allows you to be happy in, uh, in the presence of the sun. So uh, we all need to be in the sun, just otherwise we get depressed. The reason is because we uh, actually make a reaction in one of the vitamins, which precursor is the heme group. It's totally essential in all living groups. And the unique pathway is this one, which means that if the pathway is wrong, you are wrong. And this applies for humans, all kinds of animals, plants, absolutely everything but certain viruses. So porphyrias are a family of diseases that are related with the misfunction of each and every one of the enzymes that catalyze the different reactions on this pathway. And congenital erythropoietic porphyria is related directly with the ill-functioning of the uroporphyrinogen 3 synthase. Names are not important. It's just for to follow up. As I told you, the disease is very, very severe. Like People suffering that get a lot of clinical features. They are very diverse. They always get anemia, obviously, because you have a lack of a heme group. That's obvious. They also get like a porphyrinuric, which means that there is a lot of porphyrins in the urine. Hypertrichosis, which would be that it gets a lot of, uh, of uh, hair in the, in the skin. And um, skin lesions. So this porphyria actually has been related with uh, werewolves. There is a lot of, uh, of uh, tradition or, or just tales about werewolves, but most people were actually porphyria patients because they actually are anemic, so therefore they like to eat raw meat. They, they, they have skin hypersensitivity, which means that they only appear at night and they have hypertrichosis, which means that they have a lot of hair. So a lot of, of the old ancient tales about werewolves are indeed poor guys or girls suffering from uh, a kind of porphyria. Historically speaking, in this country also is related with uh, porphyria, in this case variegate porphyria, because it is, I mean, it, it is assumed that the, the King George III of England had a variegate porphyria. And what is not clear is uh, to which extent this affected the ruling of the country in a delicate moment as it was the war with the United States and the independence of the colony. Regardless of what happened to the king, essentially porphyria is, is a very easy uh, disease to be diagnosed. Why? Because you get red urine very easily. You get red urine then you do a blood analysis, and then you can obtain very quickly uh, confirmation that you get porphyria. Because it's a rare disease, then you have to get the confirmation from your ancestors. So then you need a gene analysis 
both of you and from your parents in order to, to, to do the, the gene sequencing. So you, you need to, to find the defect in this enzyme, but already you know where, the, where it is, so you, you know where to look. The problem, obviously, is, as I told you before, is that the treatment of porphyria is actually only palliative, mostly. So you have, you have problems with, uh, with anemia. You need heme group derivatives. You have some metabolic disorders that have to be regulated with glucose, for instance. And you have the problems of the skin that they can be treated with beta-carotene. But it doesn't cure anything. It just is a painkiller for the moment that you have the symptoms. And you have to take them uh, all. I know a lot of patients of porphyria. And it's, it's really, really, really a, a lousy life. There are obviously some kind of therapies that would be curative. And this applies for many, many, uh, for many rare diseases. Because the problem is in the gene code, solution is to replace the gene code. And you have two ways of doing so. One of them is the bone marrow transplantation. That applies for porphyria. Why? Because this is a hematopoietic porphyria. Mostly, this, uh, this enzyme is expressed in, in, uh, in blood cells. Therefore, if you remove the bone marrow and then you do a transplantation of that, you are correcting the defect. And therefore, the new blood is going to be OK. That has a problem, the immune system. That is a very, very, very severe intervention into your body. And you may die from that. You have to be in a bubble because you don't have immune system at all when this is happening. And actually, there are seven cases of uh, transplantation. Two of them died from an infection. And there is a new, a new way of uh, dealing with that, which is called the gene therapy. For those of you who don't know that, gene therapy is actually using viruses. Viruses, what do they do? They infect cells, and they insert the DNA in order to produce the protein for their own purpose. So you can use a virus, modify it, put the DNA of the correct enzyme, and then use the machinery of a virus in order to infect cells. That is called gene therapy. And that is applied. That works. But it has a problem, that the virus doesn't care where it inserts the virus. And your chromosome is actually subtly encoded. And in one cell, it will be in the right place. In other, pla in, other, uh, in other cells, it will be in the wrong place. So you never know where actually this is producing more benefit or problem to there. So as I said, the porphyria, as any other uh, rare disease, is actually a genetic problem. And in this case, because of the patients, there are certain genetic deficiencies. This is actually the, the urosynthase gene, and those are the mutations produced. As you know, a protein is encoded by amino acids. There are 20 amino acids. And the problem in the porphyria is that you have a replacement of an amino acid for another one in a certain position. This plot here shows you the different problems, different replacements that have been encountered in the, liter in the literature. There are uh, around 25, 26. There, there are more uh, from time to time, depending on the, on the time. And that is the frequency found in the different patients. And in the right side, wha what I show you is in yellow, mild patients, in orange, severe patients, and in, uh, in red, very, very, very severe patients. So, and th that as a function of the mutation that they have. Two conclusions can be drawn from here. One of them is that you have a lot of different positions in the mutations that can produce the, 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 the disease. That is because the enzyme works in a certain way that everything is needed in this case. And the second one is that there is a certain mutation that is much more frequent than the rest. Actually, C73R is a very, very frequent mutation. Nobody knows why. It, this is pan-ethnic. It means that there are people in Palestine that have it, people in North America that have it, people in South America that have it, and they are certainly not related. They are not family. So it has happened several times in nature. The same solution has appeared several times. There might be a reason. We don't know this. The problem is that this is a very bad mutation. You know combines that, and it's, it's bad. 
in this particular mutation, in this particular disease, apart from the genetic defect that produces that the enzyme works badly and you don't get heme group, there is another problem, which is what they call the metabolic defect. This would be the normal route. Doesn't matter about the molecules again, but essentially what we need is this molecule. That is the one that we need for our body in order to produce the heme group. Because this enzyme is still functioning, we don't get that. It's called uroporfininogen 3. But the problem is that the precursor is unstable. This precursor is unstable, and it does not stay as is. It produces a spontaneous degradation to render another molecule. And this molecule is actually, is actually very bad. Why? Because it does not catabolize well, which means that it accumulates in the body. So that is what I, I show here. In a normal way, that would be like a pool where you don't accumulate uroporphyrin one. Why? Because if in all of you, our enzyme is working properly, therefore, the pre-uroporphyrinogen is being converted into uroporphyrinogen 3 directly without any problem. But when we have the disease, we have two problems. First, that this is not produced properly, there is less uroporphyrinogen 3, and there is more accumulation of uroporphyrin 1. That is a secondary problem, and this is very specific of this disease. And this second problem is very important because it is the, the reason why many symptoms of this disease is produced, particularly the skin lesions and the blistering and the formation. Why? Because it gets accumulating in, the, in this part of the eyes, in the, in the tip of the, uh, of the toes and, and the fingers, and at the end, at the end, they get necrotized, and you have to cut them or, or they just go. So uh, an adult of this kind of porphyria resembles much more like a lepra disease person than, uh, than any other. So this is particularly bad for, uh, for them. So, I mean, I'll try not to be too technical, but what happens at the, at the cellular level? What is the, what is the reason? Well, I'll uh, skip all the details, but essentially, the problem is related with the folding of the, of the enzyme. I don't know if you know that a protein requires to be folded. It, it has certain flexibility. Those amino acids can adopt certain conformations in a space, and not all of them are okay. Only one of them is gonna be the functional one. This is called the folded conformation. That would be unfolded, that would be folded, and there is a third conformation that would be the toxic one. It would be a, a folded conformation that is not active. This is related, for instance, to a certain uh, diseases like prion disease, mad cow disease, it's all related to this. In our case, we use a technique that is called NMR to check whether the protein is folded or unfolded. I don't pretend you to be experts on NMR or anything, it's just simply have a look to this, th those are the spectra, NMR spectra of the different proteins. It's exactly the same protein, it's just simply in different conformation. You can see that the spectrum can tell you whether the protein is properly folded or unfolded because it's quite different. This is, when it's folded, the signals spread out, just simply show a different pattern. What I'm trying to say is that this spectrum could be a good fingerprint in order to assess whether the protein is behaving correctly or not. And that's exactly what, what we use. So we analyze by this technique all the mutants, the wild type and all the mutants of the protein. And then you see like, the wild type shows a nice unfolded protein. And to our surprise, the mutants did also show very nice spectrum. So then we didn't understand what's going on here. The problem is that this spectrum is not a stable over time. It evolves over time. The protein at time zero is fine, but then it gets degraded over time, okay? And the key point for this disease is the speed of degradation, okay? Like, this is, uh, this is essentially what we see. That would be the degradation of the protein over time, and that would be the loss of enzyme activity over time. This actually shows you that just simply by degradation, you can explain the problem of the, of the protein over time. I'll skip that because uh, this is a bit technical. But essentially, this, this was done what is called in vitro. It was done in the laboratory. And what happens in our cells? What is the equivalent thing in our cells? Well, proteins in the cells only, only exist 
when they are functional. The cell is completely, completely pragmatic. Nothing stays there if it's not useful at all. This is, this is a maxima because it costs energy. Therefore, as soon as the protein is actually transformed into a non-useful one, into a non-functional uh, conformation, it will be degraded. And there are many mechanisms by which this happens in the cell. Uh, typically, there is the proteasome or there is the lysosome. There are mechanisms, it would be like the garbage can. It w it's where it's degraded. And this, pr this is com constantly produced. Constantly, proteins are created, born, and killed in the cell. Why? Because they are no longer functional or no longer necessary. So that's what we measure in the cell. And what we observe is that, that the protein actually lasts for a certain while. I mean, it, it lasts a lot the wilted protein, but when you get these mutations, remember that one, the aggressive mutations, essentially the protein at the beginning is okay, but it doesn't last long enough in order to exert its function. And that is the problem. And it's very important to find the problem because you need to know the problem in order to find the solution. So if the problem is that the protein is misfolded over time, there is a certain solution, which is to find a molecule that acts as a staple, like it retains the, the protein in its conformation. And that's exactly what we are working on that now. But for the last part, what I'm going to show you is actually our try to attempt to correct the metabolic defect. This defect that I show you, that it was uh, in, the, in the patient, that it was the accumulation of the uroporphyrin one. Why is that? Because how can we correct that? Well, there is a certain strategy that would be to inhibit the previous enzyme. Because then what we do is just not produce pro uroporphyrin one, but just to uh, stay at this precursor. That precursor is stable. And therefore, what we do is just like avoid the accumulation of uroporphyrin one. Any potential treatment should be complemented with the uh, uh, administration of heme derivatives, because that does not correct the problem of the non-production of Euro3. But ideally, the both combina uh, the combination would be an efficient therapy. And that's exactly what, uh, what we have done. And in the process of uh, drug discovery, it uses a lot of computational time. At the beginning, what you do is use the computer in order to do a test of the molecule. We have programs that mimics the protein and uh, mimics the molecule how it should behave. That, in principle, we tried with about 400 molecules. Now we're going to try with uh, about uh, 2,500 molecules. That tells you, that gives you a lot of positive values, but not all of them are okay. Then you have to, then you have to do a more stringent test, a still computational, which is called a docking with uh, some water molecules, and then you still you reduce that to 15 molecules. And then you go to the experiment. And in our case, for the 15 molecules that computationally predicted that it would bind to this enzyme, seven of them had certain bindings as measured by NMR spectroscopy, by a, a way that I won't explain it today. And then when we measure the enzymatic assay, one of them was good. Why? Because it could inhibit the enzyme. And that, was, uh, that would be the, the final test, because it could bind in a place that it does not do anything but it has to bind in the active site. And at the end, we could find one. I mean, this is outdated. Now we have uh, some more. And this is just the active site of the enzyme. This would be the, the cofactor. That would be where the substrate binds. And this is where our molecule binds. But we need more proof. And the proof for, for the, this is just the in cell cultures. So what we do is just put cell cultures in there, like uh, cultivate cells in a, in a, yeah, in, in a, in a glass, and then, add some inhibitor. And then this is the uh, spectrum. This would be the UV spectrum of the porphyrin region. And then you can see that it can modulate with and without the inhibitor, the, the porphyrin. And the last result that I show you is that this also works in the next stage, in the preclinical phase. That would be in animals, in mice. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure most of you will be kind of even upset for that, but uh, this, is, this is important to show that those are mice that are actually have been created with the disease. Those are porphyric mice. 
this is very important for us to test on the on the on uh, on the disease because we need a model, and the model is the mice. So these mice, those dots here, are essentially the skin lesions. When you when you administer the compound, then you can see that the uh, skin lesions are gone. Therefore, it means that actually this compound is working. I'm not saying that this is a drug. Why? Because this is efficient, but remember, it has to be safe. And this is not safe at all. The, this, this compound in particular has many side effects that would preclude to use it in any other patient. But it's a, it's a good start because now we know exactly what we need. And all we have to do is just to modify chemically this compound in order to increase what is called selectivity into the enzyme, not to tackle the other enzyme and therefore become it into a, into a safe drug. And essentially, I think it's, yeah, almost about time. Uh, I don't know, uh, this is essentially what I, I wanted to say. Just, uh, I mean, this is a, I explain a, a bit about the research project and typically we, we agree on the, on the people who actually has, has done the work which are here. And this is uh, obviously, as everything in science, it has to be um, a collaboration. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is it. I, I will be happy to, to take any questions. Thank you. have a question when you say that this compo compound can stop uh, you know that enzyme doesn't the accumulation of the precursor cause any effect or does it get degraded or something you mean for the for the compound yeah like the first one the i think it was the pgb or something yeah okay so so the question is that if uh, if i understood the question is that if the the if the PBT actually produces any effect, no, the, uh, no, um, no, that is exactly a strategy. I mean, what, uh, what the, what essentially I, I do is just transfer this porphyria into the former porphyria. Because if you think about, then uh, what it, what I'm making is that the former enzyme is not working properly, and that uh, that contains the other porphyria. So the other porphyria does not have this very drastic effect. And the reason is because precisely this, uh, this PBT uh, is not toxic. It can be degraded. It has a degradation. I mean, it obviously accumulates, but the, reason, the, the problem is not that it accumulates. It's just that the body can clear it out and the PBT can, do, uh, can be done and the uroporphyrin one, uh, uroporphyrin not in one, goes to uroporphyrin one and gets stuck there. And it's very difficult to, to clear it out from the body. There is another question there. Hello, hello. Yeah. yeah. So, a small question. Uh, you are in now in the phase that you are trying to find a small chemical modification, so it's not harmful. That's like your phase of the mm. project now. Yeah. Yes, so the question is that which phase is now in the project in terms to obtain a, a drug for, for this porphyria? Yes, so what we have is essentially what is called a fragment. It's not even a compound because, you know, in order to be selective, you need to add carbon. Like uh, a molecule can be a potent inhibitor or not to a certain molecule, uh, but in order to be specific, uh, typically it has to be bigger. And then we are in the process now of expanding the molecule without losing its activity for this enzyme and to avoiding to bind to any other enzymes that will reduce the toxicity. And this is still in preclinical phase. There are many, many ways of doing so. Uh, I mean, this is well known now. I mean, it's, it's well established. And this is probably the last of the steps that I can do in public research because it's uh, still with a number of money, a uh, number of zeros in the money that is still uh, <laughs> acceptable. From that point on, it has to be surrendered to a company. Otherwise, this is it. I mean, it's impossible to do it with, with public research. Because it's not interesting for public research? Oh, it is completely interesting. It's just too expensive. I cannot apply for a grant of uh, 10 million euros in order to get a clinical phase. 
that has to be uh, private money, like a uh, entrepreneur company or or uh, you know uh, venture capitals or there, there are mechanisms. Uh, European Union has certain funding for that, but it has to be. Uh, I mean, you you cannot apply to grant of uh, of such an amount. I mean, it's just simply you wouldn't get it. But when the track is finished, it pays off for the company. It does pay off. Yes, it does pay off. But uh, but. Uh but the problem is that uh, you don't have any guarantee that this will happen because there are, I mean, uh, I mean so far so good. I mean, this is seven years work, but I, I cannot tell you that this actually, th this, this toxicity will be corrected. I mean, uh, the body is highly nonlinear, you know, so, so you, you I it's, it's really a venture, a a adventure capital, I would say. <laughs> And uh, these patients, without any treatment, how long do they live? So, so the question is, uh, how long do they live, the patients? Yeah. I think that um, they, in this case of porphyria, they can live long. They, I think that the expectation, life expectation is reduced by 15% uh, or so. There are not that much data because uh, like this porphyria has been a lot misdiagnosed. Uh, and it's only diagnosed properly since 1920s. When Gunther, I mean, this is called Gunther's disease, and uh, Gunther uh, clearly saw that this was a different disease from from the from the other one that was diagnosed. I think in this case they can live long. Depends on how much th do they take care of themselves. The problem is that quality of life in Chile. Quality of life is awful, awful, absolutely awful. I mean, they they really cannot go out into the sun. Um, like a good friend of mine who is a patient of porphyria, she doesn't have hands at all so it's uh, and this this limits completely your yeah. okay thank you hey i'm Micha, biotechnology student and i'm wondering um the first question is um does the increase of price for drug development worry you and do you think um that in the future it will get lower okay so both interesting questions. The first question is that if the, the, the price of the drug development is, is going up, and the second one, uh, and, and if it bothers me, the answer is yes, it bothers me. Uh, and, and the second question is if it will go down. This is a complex question, and it's more political than scientific. I think, for what I read, is that it is true. Big pharmas actually created high regulations in order to remove some small competence from the market. And nowadays, to put a, a pharma, a, dr a drug into the market, it has become a real challenge, a real challenge. This does not apply directly to orphan drugs because the numbers are uh, still much more limited, much less because there are not enough patients. But if you are considering uh, set up a, I don't know, um, drug for a headache or a <laughs> a stomach disease or whatever, this, this, is just, this is just almost impossible nowadays. But there is another point, which is now that the, the farmers have realized that it's very difficult, even in these cases, to get a new drug into the market. And now, recently, there is a new tendency is to share absolutely everything and to rely back into the, into the, into the organizations. So farmers are essentially dropping research and uh, relying more and more in, into, the, into the public uh, companies in order to do research, and they are essentially only outsourcing and then redeveloping the, the new ones. For that, I, I would expect that, yes, it will drop down, even though it will be tax money in the future. Another question there? So, like, with the rare diseases, wouldn't it be, in general, a better idea just to take care before the child is born to take care of genetic information to take care of what sorry uh, genetic information of yes. the parents and yes yes uh, and, and, and this is so th so the question is whether it wouldn't be better to take the genetic information from the parents that is the thousand genome a project thousand dollar genome project so essentially uh, i don't know if you have seen any of you have seen the movie gataka uh, in the past for those of you who have seen that this is not that far away from reality. So essentially, now we are almost at the $1,000 genomic sequencing. 
of the of uh, people and there are enough projects that actually are tackling on the variability the normal variability of the genome what i'm trying to say is that in a, in the near future we will know what do we expect to have for a certain gene when we do that and it will be cheap enough in order to analyze your genome and know what you are that there is a lot of money and a lot of uh, spin-off companies that are working on that and there is a lot of information that if you do if you have that obviously you may you may already take the precaution of not having kids or whatever but that that would be only that would be too cruel solution for that would be uh you know if you go to uh, uh Fertili fertilization, then you can tackle directly uh, and then correct the, the problem. This this is obviously uh, obviously a clever a clever thing to do, but that has some moral implications that I I don't go through, but you you can imagine very easily, and it is potentially <laughs> dangerous. But yes, yes, I think it's it's going there. Any. Further question, comments, or oh, five minutes. You have five minutes, guys. If you want <laughs> <laughs> another one. Uh, with animal testing, I just don't know about it much, but I have seen a few demonstrations, like against it. But I wonder how is it possible to develop drugs without animal testing? If there is any real path for it, or no, there is no. So the question is that uh, how to overcome animal testing. And this is an important problem as well. I mean, I'm a chemist, and I, I like nature, and I hate, I mean, I, I don't touch animals. I mean, I couldn't. But, uh, but there is no way of overcoming that, because regulations require to prove that in a mammal. And the, the less mammal, and even in mouse, you cure cancer in mouse several times, it doesn't work in pig, and it does not work either in human. But you need that. So nowadays, situation is there are very uh, strict regulations for the use of animals. We have to do a lot of paperwork, and I'm not complaining, I'm not criticizing, I think it's fair enough, but there is only when there is a justified use for that, you do the test. And this is an increasing, we are becoming civilized. This period where you would do kind of dissection in biology is gone, essentially, and now, every day more, you really need to uh, justify that. And if there is any test that is alternative, you have to use it by law. And we do. Also, it's much more, it's much more expensive to use animals. But at the end, you have to. For drug development, you have to, for sure. Any further comments? Okay, so it was a real pleasure to be here.